I'm Glenn McGuinness and this is Outburst. On the program, are you concerned about the deterioration of Canada-India relations? Uh, yes, very much because my family is in India. In the long term, no, because countries do have problems from time to time. Diplomats will do their job and will reach the right agreement at some point. There shouldn't be that sort of action taken on Canadian soil against Canadians. But first, many of us have been seeing and even feeling the effects of a strained economy brought on by a pandemic, inflation and higher interest rates put in place to bring those inflation numbers down. Currently, Canada's unemployment rate sits at roughly 5.5%. But the youth unemployment rate in this country is sitting at double that, at 11%. Navigating our way back to economic prosperity is never an easy job. So we asked Canadians to give us a progress report on the state of our finances so far. Our question. On a scale of 1 to 10, how do you feel Canada is doing as a country economically? I think it's a hard question because often we measure economic, how we're doing economically by like GDP or like other kind of more ob like objective, large scale metrics. But um, the people in my community are suffering. Um, I know students in particular, I just graduated, students are suffering extremely, particularly international students, um, folks who are low income, who are indigenous, um, who are marginalized, uh, are are suffering greatly and um, I think that the general ability of people to afford the necessities of life is a better marker of how our economy is doing and so in that sense I would say pretty bad probably a three or four out of ten. We're falling and I would say we're falling fast so out of a one to ten one being really bad, 10 being really good, I'd say we're sitting at a four. Canada is probably a four. It, it, it needs just that little oomph to get over the hump so that we can get back onto recovery. Um, interest rates are too high right now. Um, loans costing Canadians thousands of dollars more than they did last, this time last year. and. Uh, the wages just haven't kept up with this inflation business that's also going on at the same time. So we're, we're struggling to get to, just to stay even, which is why it's a four. I'd say we're at about a six or seven out of ten, reasonably decent. I think our central bank has done an okay job. Certainly in COVID, our economy required support. And by support, that meant zero percent interest rates and a lot of money printing. With that, we're suffering the effects, the hangover, so to speak, which is inflation. Two. Uh, well, we're not completely uh, underwater yet, but, uh, you know, the periscope's still sticking up. <laughs> but that's going down fast. Uh, I don't know if we can recover from it. 7.5. Why 7.5? Because the world is not doing well overall and Canada is comparatively doing better than most countries in the world. You think it's deserving of a higher score? It does. Maybe at least nine. Considering the resources we have, the economic advantages we have, I think it deserves at least a nine. Right now, compared to how we've done historically, I would say probably a three. I think if you compare this with developing countries, for example, we're obviously at 22 but it really depends what your what your scale is if it's a historical scale against itself i think we're doing pretty poorly i think if it's a it's a it's a scale against the world i think we're still doing pretty well i think we have it pretty good here um i would say having just come from portugal and the u.s canada is doing um a solid nine that's a high score it is a high score because uh um, the sh our streets are clean, the, the people are fed uh, on the whole, it, um, the companies are running, uh, small businesses are operating, I think we're doing all right. I'd say we're doing around seven, seven and a half. I just feel that the tax burden and the bureaucratic burden, uh, especially in the province of Quebec where you've got multi layers of everything and it's just cost prohibitive. 
Hence, all the companies going to Ontario where they just open the door and make things easier for companies to set up shop. I'll give it five. I think we could do a lot better, but I think we could do a lot worse. Uh, I think we need to change in Ottawa to uh, do better economically. One. <laughs> Sorry. Um, prices are going up. Uh, living is hard. If you go to, I'm from Nova Scotia, and like, I don't know if Newfoundland has this or not, but like, there's people living in tents, like families, not ho not not people without jobs, people with jobs, and they're living in tents in a park. That's wrong. That is so wrong. Our, there's something wrong with our government. There's something wrong with the the world if that that happens in today's society. The housing prices are. Employ like our pays like we're just it's not good it's not good it's not a world that I like living in right now for countless people in this country their economic situation continues to be at the critical point but the price of groceries gas utilities rent the list goes on climbing more and more every year many Canadians don't know where to turn next the idea of a guaranteed livable basic income has been floated around before and many people feel it's exactly what's needed to help them relieve their financial stress. But critics of this will tell you that they feel it's just a band-aid solution and does not address the root cause of these problems directly. So we took to the streets with this question. Would the promise of a guaranteed livable basic income be enough to garner your vote in a federal election? No, I think it's, I, I care about a lot more issues than just that particular basic living income issue. I think that's, that's an important issue, obviously, given the economy, but I think I still care about climate. I still care about, you know, the well-being of the planet. I care about the well-being of humanity. I think it's, you, you can't just pick one election issue and say that's going to be the make or break issue of this election. I think you have to look at platforms overall and make intelligent decisions. Uh, actually, yeah, I think so. Um, because I do think that it could solve quite a few problems for a lot of Canadians and um, potentially, especially like our um, homeless population, um, people struggling to make ends meet. And I think that that would be um, a good sustainable living cost, as long as it is genuinely a basic living like it you know what you can live off of <laughs> uh no because mm. uh, i uh yeah i see that as uh, very difficult to do okay tell me why uh because i feel we might not have enough financial resources to do that so because money has to come from somewhere yes yeah that would that would give my support um i think that's very reasonable and uh you know, I think uh, it would it would support people to actually do the work, not just have a job for the sake of having a job, but do things that they actually like and are passionate about and, and, and kind of pursue pursue their dreams, which I think is also like a privilege to be able to have that opportunity here in Canada that we that other other countries won't have. So I, it does garner my support. That idea is great, but I would need to know how like someone would make that happen and the background of what what those promises are kind of connecting to. You feel it's easier said than done? I, I agree with that, yes. I'm not sure that just that would be enough to get my vote. Uh, I think there's some places that have voted even against that, like Sweden uh, looked into it, did some research and thought that uh, that wouldn't be the way to go. I'd have to hear more about it, of course, uh, but just as a blanket statement, no. Another hard one to answer. Possible, I'm not at that stage yet. Uh, <laughs> I'll be retired in about five or six years, but um, it would be uh, a good thing. Um, that everybody needs a basic guaranteed income. I don't think the seniors especially have enough of a um, income now to keep them sustainable, especially with the cost of living and everything else. No, because they're going to take the money from where? It's not, it's a, it doesn't grow on trees, as they say, so the money has to come from somewhere. Someone's going to lose out if I get that full minimum uh, income. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's just a dignity, for simple dignity. I mean, you know, everybody should have a livable income. It's, you know, 
It's as simple as it's as simple. A simple di- uh, 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 issue of dignity. No, because I think it depends where you live in Canada. Basic salary depends on where you live. Cost of living is not the same equally throughout Canada. And, um, you know, if you, if you raise minimum wage, let's say, then the price of the apple will go up because small businesses will either shut down, they have to increase their salaries. So, no, I don't agree with that. I tend not to be a one, one issue voter, so I don't think so. Um, if it was combined with other things, maybe I would, but not just on a one issue. Well, we already have that, you know, with caveats, you know, you have to apply and qualify and stuff for welfare or any benefit that you would get from the government. Um, is that not enough? Do we, do we need to guarantee that people don't have to go to school or, or at least go out and work for a living when they're young and able to? You know, I'm old, so it, you know, it's kind of a moot point for me, but, you know, I'm thinking, you know, don't people want to get ahead and try to own their own home and, you know, live the life they want? Definitely not. That is, that's not enough. Uh, and, you know, I feel like something like that requires uh, taxes going further up and they're, they're already at ridiculous prices. And, you know, I, I get my paycheck every bi week, like bi weekly, and I'm like, hey, Where's uh, one-fourth of my paycheck going? I didn't know the government paid work that much for me. <laughs> and so I'm not necessarily a fan of free money for all. I think universal basic income can work in certain circumstances. I don't think we figured it out yet. And what we've had thus far has had negative effects in terms of decreasing the amount of employed people. Oh, definitely. Yeah, most definitely. I'd vote for any party. That would be that, that would be what I consider a more progressive form of capitalism. A loan, like yes, but it depends. Uh, what are the strings attached to that? Um, I think a universal basic income is a really good place to start, but that's just one piece of a pie in making um, life livable and affordable for everyone. And I think. Uh, I think it's a good place to start. I think if it was a one issue, if I was a single issue voter, I would, you know, it would get my vote, but there's a lot of other pieces attached to that. In which year was Jean Chrétien first elected Prime Minister of Canada? 1984, 1988, or 1993? 84, 88, 93. I'm going to go with 88. 93. 84. 93. Hmm, this is before my time. I'm going to say 1993. 88. I had 93 in my head. Me too. You're both correct. Yay! (laughs) I'm I'm glad you're happy. (laughs) Yes! After years as a federal cabinet minister under Lester Pearson and Pierre Trudeau, Jean Chrétien became Prime Minister of Canada in 1993. The 1993 federal election was one of the most memorable in Canadian history. With the Progressive Conservatives firmly holding power since 1984, they were reduced to just two seats. It was the worst defeat of a federal government in the country's history. On November 4, 1993, Jean Chrétien was sworn in as Canada's 20th Prime Minister. Over the last month or so, Canadian Indo relations has probably seen its lowest point ever. Here's a recap. Recently, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau stood up in the House of Commons to suggest that there was credible evidence that the Indian government was behind the assassination of a Sikh activist on Canadian soil outside of a Sikh temple in Surrey, BC. The Indian government denies any involvement in this murder and says this man had ties to terrorism. Ever since, the relations between our two countries has bottomed out. But it's been reported that India wants more than half of the 61 Canadian diplomats in that country out 
but Canada is still trying to cool things down because of the important trade relationship between our two countries. So we took this question to Canadians. Are you concerned about the deterioration of Canada-India relations? I don't know the deep details, but there's no way in my opinion that the Canadian government would get involved with accusing India if they didn't have some factual information. The fact that the Indians from the United States and around the world all met in Canada this weekend tells me there's a lot more behind the story. Uh, it depends on what the, uh, the evidence is that they have for the, the claims and whether it should be done in public versus in private at first and if there was any back channel conversations that occurred prior to calling it out in the media I guess and seeing if there was a way to deal with it a bit more discreetly perhaps up front but uh, if it's true then yeah it's concerning and there shouldn't be that sort of action taken on Canadian soil against Canadians. I mean to be honest I mean everyone has a right to know right? Uh, but definitely should have been just a diplomatic thing because now it's raising lots of concerns. Like my parents are so much concerned. They are like every single day, are you okay? Is everything fine? Although literally you see around there's nothing happening. So I think it's just an issue which was escalated for no reason. And there could have been just a privacy to it and just put an end to that. Not bring it up. Well, I think, you know, maybe he might have poked the bear and now we're getting the repercussions of poking the bear. So I don't know how it's all going to play out in the end, but uh, it's right now it's a little uh, sensitive, you know. Yeah, maybe he, he said a little too much that he should have. Maybe he should have left it for the people involved, like the foreign ministers that deal with his stuff more. And But yeah, obviously he's ruffled some feathers over in India. So, so but no, like, I don't really know a solution to the matter. I can't say I know enough about it to make an opinion. However, I don't think it's wise as a leader to maybe throw gas on the fire a little bit. I think it maybe would be better to be a bit more diplomatic. No, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not concerned one bit. I just feel like, uh, just like per, in your personal life, like friends do fight sometimes, but at the end uh, it'll be settled. So I feel like. Canada needs India, India needs Canada. You know, we are having deteriorating relationships with with big global powers like China, and then now it's India, and then, you know, then, then it becomes like, how involved do we become with other, like other countries' affairs? And, you know, even though, it, you know, there is a bit of what happened here locally in Canada that's a concern, but um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think we should focus on our own economic problems and our own uh, growth and our own people and try to focus less on what's happening abroad. Uh, in the long term, no, because countries do have problems from time to time and after a while and they do take like actions against each other, but then it's forgotten. We, have, we had this with Saudi Arabia a couple of years ago. It seems that we've forgotten it and now the relations should be kind of okay, I believe. Yeah. We had this with China. Things, I think, can still develop and be better. So with India, I know Canada has like kind of a strategic alliance. Even though currently uh, things are not going well, I think in the longer run it will fix itself. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about Canada's perception in the world in general. So by, by proxy, I think the, the whole, you know, India issue is very visible and it's, it's a bit of a, you know, talk point about Canada on the international stage. Uh, I'm, I'm not concerned. I think diplomats will do their job and will reach the right agreement at some point. I think it's definitely a charged situation and I don't think there's an easy answer to how to make that go away. So I, I trust that the government and the intelligence agencies and whoever was involved in you know that particular issue with the assassination on Canadian soil of a Canadian citizen uh, will solve itself through the proper channel. So I, I, me as a, as, a, as a private citizen, I don't think I know enough and obviously I'm not, I don't have security briefings given to me to be able to tell you how that's going to play out in the long term and what's, what's happening in the back channels around that issue. Uh, yes, uh, because I'm concerned about all Canada's international relationship deterioration, including China and other countries. Um, we're too small 
a nation to not make good friends in the world. I think that's the simplest answer. Mm, only marginally. I think relations will return to normal rather quickly after. There's always a new trendy, I don't know, a new trendy scandal, fiasco, something, right? Uh, I think we have bigger issues to look at as far as Canada goes and international relations. I'm also Indian about myself, like, you know, but I was born in the States. So I do have Indian parents at home and, you know, it's kind of a, a weird situation right now. And yeah, we're just hoping everything just maintains and just goes back to it, what it used to be, hopefully. Uh, yes, very much because my family is in India. So it is like a very big problem because like when my grandparents want to come here, they can't. They, they're very scared. So yeah, it's a, it's a problem for me. Yeah, I, I think for sure I am. I think I'm obviously of Indian heritage, so it's something I take seriously. And being also Canadian, it's it's important and close to home, for sure. Definitely a little bit. I mean, you want to be like in good relation with the rest of the world, especially when we're kind of a smaller country and not smaller in size, but I mean smaller in economic impact and military power and stuff like that. And I mean, a country like India is so powerful. And if they want to team up with someone like China, we definitely have to be worried about that. Every year, roughly a quarter million people experience homelessness in every corner of this country. With cold weather just around the bend, Canadian winters can prove to be deadly for those with no real option for proper food or shelter. We talked to Canadians about what ideas they might have to make things better for those who need it most. Our question. What could be done to improve poverty and homelessness on our streets? It's just such a complicated question because it's really nuanced. Um, without actually having a background knowledge of how these things work, I would say probably we need to get to the root cause of why people are on the streets. Maybe going towards um, more mental illness, um, you know, uh, like support, um, addiction support. Um, that's like really sustainable for people and is um, long term. Well, I live uh, in Vancouver, in Gastown, which is actually um, um, ground zero for the downtown east side and homelessness. Um, I think uh, we need to have uh, more concentrated um, uh, poverty reduction, but also um, uh, uh, drug uh, re re rehabilitation. Um, and we, we don't have enough of that. I know that's provincial, not federal, but we definitely uh, need to support people to get out of their addiction and to um, find ways of integrating them back into society. I think definitely trying to, um, well in Alberta, definitely giving away less money like of our oil money and stuff like that and um, trying to keep it uh, and be used in our own streets and programs for ourselves um, and also making sure that not too much of our money goes overseas to places like Ukraine and stuff like that with Trudeau and uh, trying to keep our money here because we have big problems. Um, invest in mental health. I think that's the the biggest root cause is uh, insufficient attention to understanding and providing support for mental health. If I choose to be a nomad and live in the street and I have my wits about me, I will do just fine. But m many of the people who are homeless or destitute have other things that need medical attention and their system is not prepared to acknowledge and investigate those. That's turning out to be more and more the answer these days. Um, I think the issue is always tackled on a very surface level, you know, things like handing out um, basic needs and goods is also always very handy and helpful, but the issue goes deeper than that. Ultimately, things like available work and available housing and affordable housing is something that's deep set in the issue that's not often tackled. So. Things like work opportunities and training and skills and development and, you know, it's it's a very extensive, extensive and it requires things like funding and programming and, you know, a very strong approach. So uh, it depends what level you're looking at. If you're talking about handing out goodie bags, that's one way to help. And if you're talking about creating jobs and creating, you know, housing and whatnot. So it depends how deep you look into it. but providing harm reduction resources first and housing. And uh, it's got to start there. Uh, I don't see anything else being realistic. And uh, yeah, so, so that's where I would start. <laughs> Trying 
to create proper shelters, like shelters for women with children, shelters for men with children, shelters for families. Um, there's no shelters for men with children. There's no, and the only shelters for women with children are only um, women fleeing abuse. Like that's, that should, that sh it shouldn't just be that. It should be, there should be more options available for everybody in order to help uh, decrease the homelessness and also just investing in housing, like investing in affordable housing. And that's where it all comes down to. And having proper employees to do their jobs, you know, people that are, being hired to do housing actually do that. <laughs> I'm thinking opening up a proper facility, not right in the heart of the high-end residential where there's so much controversy going on, something with health care, mental health, drug health, and accommodation where they can get help, have a place to stay and get back on their feet. Maybe it will give them a better chance best thing is a time machine go back 10 years and put in rent control but uh, um, yeah that's uh, what could be done about it more like social housing isn't always the answer because that has to be paid for by taxpayers so everybody's taxes go up then it gets everything else gets more less affordable because everybody um, yeah I guess they have to put a cap on rent increases or set a rate that this is this is this this price goes for this but then gets people complain saying that's too socialist. Well, if I were queen. <laughs> um, no, I think it's absolutely essential that we have more compassionate addiction care and support for mental health. And the fact that people who are mentally ill and, you know, addiction is an illness, that they're sleeping on the streets is an atrocity. It's really an atrocity. And if you look at it as if you're coming from another planet, it's like, how could a society do that? let people sleep in the cold rain just because they're sick. So it's a lack of compassion and I'd love to see funds put into a much more comprehensive care. I know everybody's saying something like that, but criminalizing and, you know, don't even get me going on what happens to people in prison, you know, but it's, com it's about compassion and intelligence. <laughs> Thanks for watching this episode of Outburst on CPAC. If you have any comments about this show or any other show, you can find us on social media. You can also find us on our website at www.cpac.ca. I'm Glenn McGinnis, and on behalf of my colleagues at the Cable Public Affairs Channel, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.